Hello everybody, and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. In my last video I focused on this large circular feature next to the ruins of Saxe Horman known as Kokachinkarnas, and how this was likely a large man-made reservoir in times gone by. This is because, in Quechua, the term coca refers to a lake, pool or pond, either natural or man-made, and also because there are many other very similar coca structures in Peru and Bolivia, all known for being reservoirs. Due to its proximity to Sacsayhuaman and Cusco, this one was probably very important to the Inca Empire. Unless you're in the field, it is hard to look into this much further, because Google Maps and Google Earth just don't have enough resolution, and therefore you can't see the site and the surrounding structures in the level of detail needed. Thankfully, there is an incredible resource that is available to everyone, and it's available on sketchfab.com, published by the user Drone Tech Peru. I've left a link in the description below, because you will want to have a play. This is a detailed, fully interactive 3D model of Coca Chincanus, and the resolution really is incredible. Thanks to this, I believe I can now start to unravel the mysteries of the Sacsayhuaman complex, such as why there are different types of masonry and what their function could have been. I've started this mini project in a logical manner, starting with the fact that Coca Chincanus is a man made reservoir. An assumption may be, but based on evidence and logic. But to be a reservoir on relatively high ground, you need to have at least one source of water. As stated in my last video, it is well known that Coca Chincanus was fed by at least one spring, and it is apparently located in this region here, close to the Rhododero Formation Igneous Extrusion. This is actually to be expected, because geologically speaking, this is nonconformity. A place where two different rock types, two different formations meet at an unconformable and abrupt boundary. Any water that's flowing through the softer fissured limestone bedrock would eventually be met by a much harder mass of igneous rock, rock that it can't pass through. Often at such boundaries, water comes to the surface and forms a spring. Now, for some background, a lot of research has been done on the relationship between the Inca, water and ritual. And although it's not the subject of this video, there is plenty of evidence to say that water was a key symbol in Andean thought. The control of water meant the control of power, because if managed correctly, you can effectively provide food and water for the people. But water was also a key element in the Inca vision of the cosmos. Myths say their civilization arose from the sea, through one of its main manifestations in Lake Titicaca. Water was a sacred element in all Andean cultures, especially through the period of Inca dominance, and studies show that the Inca vision of the cosmos was based on water. This is a rich and detailed line of study, and I could go into this a lot more. But for the sake of this video, a brief understanding of the importance of water to the ancient Peruvians is really all we need. It means that Coca Chincanus was likely an incredibly important site, and the natural springs that fed the reservoir would have been deemed sacred, especially in such an agricultural society. With that in mind, let's take a closer look at the sacred spring. Although I don't know its precise location, I have it on good authority it's somewhere in this region right here, where we can see a mass of natural limestone, some still connected to the bedrock, some in the form of broken boulders, damage that is clearly quite recent in history. But looking past the destruction for a moment, the general morphology or shape of the limestone is naturally rounded and eroded, just like we'd expect if the rocks are in close proximity to a source of water. At this point, I went back to the podcast I did with Ben from Uncharted X, because I remembered that he showed these features in quite some detail. At the time, I couldn't put them into context with the wider landscape. It all seemed alien to me. But now that I know that this region is the position of a sacred spring, it all does start to make sense. 
As stated, the natural limestone here looks so badly eroded because it would have been constantly affected by running water, a process that would have been ongoing for centuries, likely millennia, possibly way before any humans settled at this location. Ben shows that many of the limestone outcrops and boulders also display a number of man-made cuts and shapes, including steps and other geometric features, and these were clearly incised into the rock after the bulk of erosion had taken place. Because the cut surfaces are less eroded, and in many cases they still look sharp. I believe that because of the spring emanating from it, this site was sacred, and that's why the Andean people left this specific outcrop of limestone in situ. They didn't quarry it, but they did sculpt it. Such sculpted outcrops are known as wakas. There are probably many reasons for the sharp cuts in geometric features we see. Firstly, they will likely work to channel the spring water in a specific way to direct the water in a particular direction. Secondly, the cuts and shapes could be artistic, spiritual and ritualistic, having a much deeper meaning, a way to venerate this important sacred site in the natural landscape. Some think the straight cuts and shapes denote order from nature. Some think they have astronomical significance because of the way that light falls on the outcrops at different times of the year, and the way that the shadows fall. Some say that the step platforms cut into them were in fact counting devices. The subject is vast, detailed and complex. Some people call the sculpted boulders memory scapes. They have a long history in the Andes and are even seen in the ancient city of Corral, a site dating back to before 2500 BC. They are also often found inside an agricultural setting, for example at the archaeological site of Las Pelas in Argentina, and through their study, experts believe they were involved in agricultural fertility rituals, to ensure the land stayed fertile. This limestone outcrop we've been looking at so far is a sacred waka, but it's not an easy place to research because the whole site is a complete mess. It's been well and truly destroyed. Maybe by some freak of nature, a build-up of extreme water pressure, or maybe by the gunpowder of the conquistadors, or later in history with dynamite. It's not documented exactly what happened, we can't know for sure without further study, but the destruction certainly doesn't look to be very ancient, because many of the sharp cuts have been smashed, and these sharp cuts and geometric features can't be extremely old, because they do show a lack of erosion. But in all the chaos, we can see traces of ancient architectural and water management planning, and I think that this part of Sacsayhuaman can actually help us to understand at least one reason why we see polygonal masonry across the region. Right next to what was once an outcrop of limestone with a natural spring is this man-made oval feature. It was excavated a number of years ago, and finds include crystals and shells, some originating as far away as Ecuador. The archaeology made experts conclude that this feature is a ceremonial basin or pool, which does make sense being right next to a sacred spring. It was probably a pool where offerings were thrown in as part of the ancient agricultural rituals and ceremonies that we know took place throughout the Andes. Interestingly, its walls are lined with the famous interconnecting fine polygonal masonry, and on seeing this again it struck me. This type of masonry may well have a specific function, allowing the basin to contain and maintain a volume of water. As we can see, directly behind the polygonal masonry is a more standard style of stonework, clearly there for added strength and stability. The polygonal masonry is like an internal lining to stop water from seeping out, as well as giving it an aesthetically pleasing finish. Of course, some water will seep through the joints, unless of course it was coated with some kind of plaster, but as long as the floor isn't permeable, this seepage would be minimal, and with a continuous supply of water from a natural spring, the pool would always maintain a certain level. Today, this one feature of the landscape shows three different types of masonry. 
but instead have been interpreted as evidence for human occupation in three different periods of time, i.e. the work of three different cultures, I think it's all work from one project, all done at the same time. The dry stone wall type of masonry that's seen behind the polygonal gives strength. The polygonal masonry gave the finish and water type properties, whilst the huge boulders of limestone bedrock with man-made cuts are of course pieces of a displaced waka, the sacred source of the spring, which would have been subject to some kind of natural or man-made destruction. We have to remember that different styles of masonry can mean different function, not always different periods of time. Today we use different materials for different types of construction projects, so whether this is all the work of the Inca or another Andean culture, I do believe it is all part of one project. As stated, and as seen in Ben's footage and also a number of videos by Brian Forster, this ceremonial water basin does contain a number of cut boulders, and evidence shows they arrived inside the basin after the polygonal walls were constructed because one enormous block actually leans on a polygonal wall. Evidence the destruction is relatively recent in the history of Sacsayhuaman, and not as ancient as many think. These huge blocks I'm sure have come from this region right here, displaced from the bedrock. This waka was once a large natural outcrop of water eroded limestone. It was found and then worked by man, and we can get an idea of what it looked like, because other limestone waka formations are found around Cocachincarnas, and these have been better preserved. I'll come to these shortly. But what we can learn from looking at the rocks, is that these cuts are not likely as old as we think. Even though the rock type is relatively hard microcrystalline limestone, possibly metamorphosed millions of years ago from the Rhododero lava extrusion, it's still subject to chemical and physical erosion. In composition, it's still primarily calcium carbonate after all. It's softer than rocks like granite and andesite, and will be affected by even small amounts of acid in rain and groundwater, as well as the erosive nature of running spring water. The rocks are well eroded, as they are natural outcrops, but the cuts we can see are still sharp, and I can't see much reason to doubt that what we are looking at is in fact Inca stonework. And that's all from a geological point of view. The stonework could also be from the Kilke culture, who apparently preceded the Inca and were at Sacsayhuaman. The Kilke were like a proto-Inca civilization, a name given to the Inca in their formative years. I found out some new information on these people, and I'll discuss this in a future video. Today, this area is extremely complex, and you can see the damage to the waka, where large chunks have clearly been smashed off. Some of these blocks may even be large overturned boulders. In all honesty, it seems somewhat pointless trying to make too much sense of this outcrop without careful mapping on site. It is extremely likely that the surrounding polygonal masonry wall that lines the ceremonial pool was once much higher, and that the limestone outcrop was also much bigger. It may well have gone right up to the Rhododero formation, as we can see some outcrops close by. It could have also butted up to the man-made perimeter walls of Cocachincarnas. Due to the destruction of the limestone bedrock, this dark line going into the coca could be showing us the path of the spring water today, if and when it is activated by heavy rainfall. When the ancient stonework was complete, I believe that water would have left the spring, travelled through the maze of carved channels and features on the natural limestone, and then flowed into the ceremonial pool. From there, excess water would have flowed into Cocachincarnas. This is seen by what looks to be an outflow pipe or hole at the edge of the coca. Another similar stone is seen in the rubble in the ceremonial pool. Maybe in the past, water would have passed from one to the other, channeling through the bedrock. Originally, I thought this feature here was a boundary wall, but looking closely on the 3D model, and it actually looks like a man-made channel, similar to other stone channels also made by the Inca. This channel begins at the Waka and the Natural Spring, and also looks to flow directly into the reservoir of Cocachincarnas, taking away excess water from the ceremonial pool. 
we know for a fact that Sacsayhuaman and other Peruvian sites did incorporate drainage systems into their monuments. The people that built this site were clearly well aware of water management and that's why their structures have withstood the test of time. I know many of you will still be unconvinced by what I've explained so far, and that's fine. But I am offering an explanation for an archaeologically complex site without being on the ground. Yet I still have more evidence. There is another large chunk of limestone bedrock found to the north of Coca Chincanas, and this is called Piedra Cansada or Chincana Grande. Many of you will have seen it before, a weird and wonderful piece of stonework, carved and worked in such a way that it blends the work of humans and nature into one unique piece of rock. It has seats and reservoirs of every shape cut into it, its sides are cut into niches and stairways, like an elaborate incomprehensible maze. Doing some research, and excavations have taken place at this location. Directly to the north there are cut terraces, to the east is a rectangular building, and abutting it to the south is an architectural compound. The southern structure has a polygonal masonry lining, and was found to link to a potential fountain basin. To the southwest of the mass of bedrock limestone, Peruvian archaeologists identified more water channels, and they were found to lead to the reservoir of Cocachincanas. There was also another building found close by, and that was described as a support structure for rituals held at Piedra Cansada. Ceremonies certainly took place here, due to the find of tupus, small idol figurines made of metal, and again, we find fragments of shells which we know are associated with water veneration. Legends associated with the rock say it was brought from some distance away by the Inca, which we know isn't the case, as it's the same rock type of the Sacsayhuaman region. But interestingly, the same legend says the stone got tired, and would not move any further and cried tears of blood. Therefore, it was named Piedra Cansada, aka the Tired Stone. The fact that legend said the stone cried, the fact that we find a compound close by with the watertight polygonal masonry, and the fact there are channels that head towards the Coca Chincanas Reservoir, all indicate that this is another site of a natural spring, another important whacker that was worshipped and venerated for its life giving properties a place to give offerings during the agricultural fertility rituals to ensure the water came forth from the rock. There are also a number of videos on YouTube that show people heading through tunnels from Piedra Cansada and ending up at Coca Chincanas. These tunnels cut through the limestone bedrock are water channels, showing clear signs of water erosion. Water really is the key to understanding the Sacsayhuaman architecture. Heading back to Coca Chincanas, and to the north we have another waka, another carved lump of limestone bedrock. Two terraces down on its western side, and there is another oval feature with a polygonal masonry lining, and this looks to be a channel flowing down from the waka into the oval basin. From this basin there is another clear channel that runs directly into the Coca Chincanas reservoir. Is this the location of yet another natural spring, or does the water from Piedra Cansada enter the reservoir through here? Evidence certainly implies it's all associated with water nonetheless. This huge chunk of exposed bedrock is situated on the very northern edge of the reservoir. It too is carved in the same way as the others, is channeled and built upon, and I would hazard a guess there is a natural spring right here as well and, because of its position, it was probably the main source of water for the reservoir. Sacsayhuaman is a geologically fascinating region, and I believe the large extrusive Rhododero formation, which sits unconformably with the limestone bedrock, is why we see an abundance of natural springs. This would have been an extremely significant and important place for the Andean civilizations, especially the Inca and it all shows that the true importance of this region is water. It looks to me that the builders of Sacsayhuaman left natural outcrops of limestone in situ wherever they found a spring, then turned them into carved wackers, channeled the water into man-made basins that were lined with polygonal masonry, and from there the water was channeled into the main reservoir. 
its importance was not just to aid agriculture, but water from Kokachin Karnas probably fed the city of Cusco itself, as seen by the topography, with a valley running from the northern side of the reservoir and heading down into the city. There are also many legends that say you can travel through the tunnels from Piedra Cansada and Sacsayhuaman and end up in Cusco. Some legends also say they go right into the heart of the Coracancha. As stated, I believe that these tunnels are in fact water channels, an incredible, complex and impressive feat of engineering by the ancient Peruvians. It is therefore no surprise that the so-called fortress of Sacsayhuaman was a place of religious and spiritual importance, with numerous temples on the summit of the hill that is surrounded by the famous megalithic polygonal walls. The whole region has a spiritual, cosmological and natural significance. We see natural hills and outcrops, but the region has clearly been heavily carved and shaped. I now look back at Sacsayhuaman and I wonder if the famous enormous outer walls were polygonal to protect the site from water. Such walls are relatively watertight and due to the irregular style of fitting, they wouldn't be greatly affected by the movement of groundwater. Very specific water channels were made in the walls and this was to manage the flow of groundwater. But I also look at the patch of flat ground between the Rodadero formation and the fortress opposite. This looks to have been purposefully shaped. The Inca Emperor is said to have once sat on the Inca throne of the Rodadero formation, looking across to the fortress in ceremonies, the Rodadero being the most important waka to the Inca. I wonder if an important Inca ceremony actually involved the releasing of water from Cocachin Carnus into this region, which may explain the need for the megalithic polygonal walls. The main temple on the top of Sacsayhuaman was apparently the Temple of the Sun, dedicated to the sun god Inti. The Inca believed that the condor had a close relationship with this powerful god, because of how high this native bird could fly. They saw the bird as the connection between the earth and the heavens. With that in mind, I went to Google Earth and zoomed out so I could see the entire site from above. And when I rotated the map 180 degrees, well, maybe I'm seeing things, but do the greenest and most fertile pieces of land actually look like the outline of a condor? The modern trackway south of Sacsayhuaman does skew the visual effect but if water was released from the reservoir, flooding the flat plain between the Rodadero and Sacsayhuaman, and then heading off into the valleys either side, due to the natural topography, this area would be the wettest and the greenest. Could the Sun Temple of Sacsayhuaman actually be placed in the centre of a giant ancient effigy of the sacred condor? Before I end this video, and before you think I'm just seeing things, did you know that in the Quechua language, Sacsayhuaman actually means the place where the hawk is satisfied? Now, if I rotate the landscape another 90 degrees, is it just me or do we also see the outline of a hawk flying above the ruins of Sacsayhuaman? Again, this looks to be highlighted by the most fertile land, the land with the highest abundance of trees and greenery, land that also looks to have its own coca water management systems at its heart. Sacsayhuaman is an incredible, mysterious and important ancient site, and I still feel like I'm only scratching the surface. But I hope with this video, I have at least opened your eyes to new ideas and interpretations. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.